We're live. Howdy, everyone. Aaron Boster here, and thank you for learning about MS with me. It's a gorgeous Saturday, the very beginning of February, and I have been looking forward all week to jumping online and joining you, this growing global online community. I am so excited to reconnect. It's been over a month. I've got a lot planned today, and there are already um, 12 people jumping online. I'm going to give everyone a few moments to get uh, situated as this global online village masses together. As always, I have a couple of requests. When you jump online, make sure that you tell me where you're calling in from. I love going back and reading through and learning all the people from Central Ohio and Central Asia and Central Europe all over the world getting together in this online community. So make sure that you share with me where you're logging on from. We have a lot planned today, including an Ask Me Anything Q&A about multiple sclerosis, as I love doing. Keep in mind, guys, that I can't diagnose you or treat you over the interwebs. <clears throat> and so you have to keep your questions um, open and general so that I can provide general answers that all of us can benefit and learn from. Uh, Chuck O is on. Uh, there's a bunch of people coming on. Ms. Tommy is here. Hello. Hello, Candy Duncan. Hello, Nian. I'm seeing a bunch of really familiar names, and that warms my heart. There's almost 94 of us that have jumped online. Now, if you're as excited as I am, make sure to give this a thumbs up. I've got uh, my Nini right there wearing my dad's old cowboy hat. Uh, my uh, team always gets uh, sassy with me when I start to wear cowboy hats, and they say, no, 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 don't do it. Um, for those of you that are familiar, if you know who this little guy is over there, type his name in the comments. And I am really excited to get rocking and rolling. As always, it's nice to have a cup of coffee as we kick things off. And there's a bunch of things that I want to go over with you today. For starters, the last time I was online with you, it was New Year's, and we were celebrating New Year's with the word of the year. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar, the word of the year is a different way of approaching a New Year's resolution, as opposed to um, making some New Year's resolution on January 1st and then doing it for maybe two to three weeks and then kind of falling off the wagon. I'm of the opinion that the word of the year is a better approach, at least for me. I pick a word that is intended to be in top of mind and to guide me through my decisions as I move forward in, in, the, in the new year. And this year, my word of the year is balance. I have a lot going on in my personal life. I have a lot going on in my professional life. I'm starting a brand new MS clinical practice that I'm super excited about, and I have to remain balanced. I really, really need to focus on time at home, time with my daughter and son, time with my wife, time with my friends, and time in clinic, time with my patients, time with my team, and figuring out that balance. And I'm not going to pretend that I'm good at it, and I'm going to give you an update. I'm doing a really bad job of staying balanced. It's something that I need to work on. Um, I am admitting publicly to you that I have not been to the gym recently, and I need to fix that. I need to take some more time to walk my dog. And right now there's so much going on with getting this clinic started that it's important that I keep in mind my 2020 word of the year, which is balance. And this is the 2020 uh, art that we made. Inside uh, that art is all the different words of the year that people proposed to us as we got ready to launch the new year. So let me check in with you guys. How is your 2020 word of the year going? There were some really good ones out there. Determination, strength were two of the most common that I heard. So send me a note in the chat and let me know how your 2020 word of the year is going. Mine, balance, is a works in progress and most certainly something that I need to work on. The theme of this live stream today is going to be evolution of thought, evolution of my thought. There are a lot of things that are evolving in my head. I am evolving as I develop my clinic and as I prepare to see patients in a way that I have not seen them before. And I want to share with you the evolution of that process and an update on my clinic build out. I want to share with you my evolving thoughts about the new oral medications in MS. 
And so in a little bit, I'll be talking to you about uh, Supanamod, which is a uh, trade named Mazent here in the United States. I'll be talking about Cladribine, which is trade name Mavenclad here in the U.S., and I'll be talking about Vumeridae or diroxyl fumarate. And so those are three new oral agents that have entered uh, the market here in the U.S., and my opinions and thoughts and about them have been evolving, and so I want to give you guys an update. Hello, Mike. It's great to see you. I also want to give you guys an update on my evolving thoughts on the space of medical marijuana and cannabis to treat symptoms in MS. And so I'm excited to share that with you. And lastly, I have a few updates on some social media projects. But before we get into that, let's take a moment for the MS Water Challenge. When I drink, you drink. Here we go, guys. All right. Got to stay hydrated, even with that coffee behind me. And let's start off by turning to the questions. And I want to spend the next five, 10 minutes answering some of your questions. Now, if I don't get to your question, please don't fret. As many of you who have followed the channel know, I will go back through the questions and anyone that I didn't answer, I'll copy and paste and I will answer them in an upcoming video or in a future live stream. Uh, Matt Z is in the house. Matt is an awesome moderator and very, very helpful. Matt, thank you for being here. He's already queued up a question from JT who asks, what are your thoughts on ketamine infusions for nerve pain? JT, very simply put, I have no experience in using ketamine. I can't answer intelligently. I can share with you, I'm familiar with a, uh, a neurologist up in the Cleveland Clinic uh, who is a specialist at using ketamine to break refractory headaches, but I don't know anything about it. So I'm not going to extend my expertise where it doesn't belong, but thank you for asking the question. All right. What else do we have question-wise? Well, Shelly writes in and asks, could you discuss possible things to do to help alleviate or manage spasms without using prescription drugs? And I absolutely would be happy to do that, Shelly. I um, have a passion for beating up on spasticity. I have a tremendous experience uh, both clinically and um, uh, academically as it relates to managing baclofen pumps. And her question is, what can we do to manage spasticity without using medications? Now, on this YouTube channel, I have a playlist with probably 20 plus videos answering that exact question, talking about how do you manage spasticity in the absence of medicines. But just for the sake of the live stream, let's take 10 tips to improve spasticity just in not taking medicines. All right, so we're going to do 10. So if I do one for each finger, then I'll have nailed all of them. So let's jump into 10 tips for how we beat up on spasticity, not using medicines. Tip number one. In fact, there are medicines that sometimes people take that can worsen spasticity. You might not know that interferon beta products, things like beta seron, rebif, extavia, plegardy, avnex, can sometimes in some patients worsen MS spasticity. So by removing medicines, now don't just go out and stop your disease modifying therapy, but by removing a medicine that can worsen spasticity, we can actually make it better. That's number one. Number two is to stretch, 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 stretch. Stretching makes a world of difference and it doesn't help tomorrow, but it helps in the now. And so if you wake up and stretch your muscles, a la track practice, make sure that you hold every stretch for about 30 seconds, because if you don't hold it for 30 seconds, your brain, your uh, muscles never really learn what it is exactly that you're doing. You will find that the beginning of your day is much easier from a spasticity standpoint. I would actually challenge someone to stretch when they wake up in the morning and when they go to bed at night, and then once in the middle of the day. If you can stretch three times a day, you're going to find that your spasticity is much better managed. So that's number two. Number three is to be aware of ambient temperatures. You will find that when it's cold outside, that you are much more spastic than when it's warm outside. And that has a lot to do with physics and the way that muscles work. And spasticity is always worse in the winter. And so taking precautions to keep your body warm, layering up the clothes when you go outside, wearing extra socks, keeping your hands warm, et cetera, can actually make a really, really big difference. The next, I think I've done three. The fourth one is to be aware of the fact that the longer you sit still, the more spastic that you're going to get. And so if you are sleeping in bed and you haven't been moving all night, you're going to wake up really stiff. 
Similarly, if you're driving your car for three hours and you're not really moving the rest of your body except maybe your arm for the steering wheel, you're going to get out of the car and be super stiff. And so a pro tip is to figure out how long can I sit before I get stiff? You may find that you can sit for an hour without getting stiff, but if you go an hour and a half, not so good. In which case, you want to set a timer. And when the timer goes off, you want to stretch. So that's the next one. Number five is movement. It's related to what I just said, but the more you move, the less stiff you're going to be. And as another pro tip, set an alarm so that when you're at work and you are sitting there typing away, doing your business, when the alarm goes off, get up and do a lap. Get up and go to the bathroom. Get up and literally do one lap around the office, then sit back down. You will find that's tremendously helpful. Absolutely. What else can we do for spasticity that's not a medicine? I would throw in focal Botox, which is maybe kind of cheating a little bit. Botox is not a pill that you take, but an injection that you get in the muscle that's creating a problem. I guess I'll throw it in, even though technically it's a medicine, but it's not a pill that you take and it has no systemic side effects. That's very relevant because a lot of the medicines that we take for MS can make us groggy or sleepy or confused, but Botox doesn't do that. Also, Botox lasts for about three months. So if you inject, I'm, I'm pointing at the muscle of the bicep in case the bicep was stiff, the benefits that you see can last three or four months. And so it's a great way of dealing with focal spasticity. Uh, what's another one that we can do? Exercising in a swimming pool can be very, very helpful. Spasticity tends to be much less of a problem when we're in water. I don't exactly know why, but I've, I've, I've seen patients recount to me in clinic time and time again that aqua therapy really, really helps their spasticity quite a bit. What else can we do to help spasticity? Get a dog. You say, what does a dog have to do with spasticity? Well, a dog makes you bend. A dog makes you throw. A dog makes you get up and walk around and it will keep you moving. And you will find that you're a lot less spastic when you're taking care of a pet. Now, I don't know that I got to 10, but I'm going to. Water. Being adequately fluid hydrated can actually help with a lot of MS symptoms. And in my experience, can certainly help with spasticity. I don't know if I've gotten to 10 or not. Um, I may be around nine or 10, but that's hopefully going to be good enough to get the, the ball rolling. If you would like more information on how to manage spasticity without using a drug, I want you to check out the playlist here in my YouTube channel where I have some 20 videos talking about spasticity. Guys, there are 200 people online right now. I don't think I've ever seen 200 people online. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Let's turn into a couple more questions before we jump back into the live stream. All right, so Matt writes, um, he's copied a, a question asked by Helen. Given your experience over the years and seeing your advancements in medicine during your professional years, do you think that we, really, that we are realistically approaching a stop cure medicine? So that's a great question. And if I summarize, um, Helen is asking me, are we within striking distance of a cure for multiple sclerosis? And my answer humbly is no, I do not think that we're within striking distance of a cure, but I want to explain. Multiple sclerosis is this crazy interface between the immune system and the nervous system, all right? So it's that, it's that strip in the middle where the immune system and the nervous system inter interface. Your immune system is really, really unique to you. If you had a twin sister, she would have a different immune system because you got the flu one time and she didn't, and she was exposed to a bug bite and you weren't, et cetera. Your immune system is rather adaptive and it develops specifically for you. Your nervous system is also one of the most complex organ systems in the body, and it's very unique to you. If you had a twin sister, your nervous systems would develop differently because she took piano and you didn't, and you learned to speak Spanish and she didn't, and your nervous systems developed differently. And so the interface between your unique immune system and your unique nervous system and that overlap are profoundly specific to you. Number two, our understanding of the immune system is still fledgling. Now, we have come a long way compared to where we were even just 10 years ago in our understanding of how the immune system works, but we're not there yet. There are cells in the brain affecting the brain. There are cells involved in the immune system affecting MS, and we don't really know completely what they do just yet. We've been studying T cells for 30 years, 
And the answer does not lie exclusively in the T cells. We have increasingly become aware of the importance of B cells, but there are other cell lines in the immune system that probably play a role. There are other cells in the brain besides neurons that probably play a role, and we don't fully understand them yet. And so as our understanding of the immune system develops, I think that we will become better and better at grappling with autoimmune conditions. I do not think that we are in striking distance to cure multiple sclerosis. Although I think that there's a lot that's happening right now, which is very, very encouraging. And I personally am very encouraged for what we're coming into because what we can offer presently is a quick diagnosis. We can offer pretty decent monitoring. What we can offer therapeutically is anti-inflammation, which is very good. It's excellent to decrease an inflamed immune system. But what we need are the things that are soon to come remyelination and neuroprotection. And as I shared in other live streams, there is an exciting mass of work that's building up and building up as we get ready for uh, adoption of remyelination and of neuroprotection. I shared in the last live stream that I did that it's my opinion that within 10 years, we're gonna have remyelinating agents on the market. And I think that's gonna be a game changer. There is increasing excitement as it relates to stem cell transplantation. It is not prime time, but it is now actively being studied here in the United States and throughout the world, and we're starting to understand it more and more. And I think that these advances are going to take us to the next level of beating up on MS. Now, before I leave this topic, and I don't want you to feel sad, blue, and depressed because we're not uh, yet ready to, uh, to offer a cure, I do want to point out that in 2020, in this year of 2020, we are able to make MS boring. Making MS boring is not a small matter. It's actually a very hard thing to do. But if we play our cards right, if we are diligent, if we attack this disease from all angles, I'm talking about taking the most effective DMT possible and make sure that it's working. I'm talking about exercising as part of your lifestyle. I'm talking about eating clean and supplementing low levels of vitamin D. And I'm talking about not smoking tobacco. I think that we stand a chance to make this disease boring. Diabetes used to not be boring. Diabetes used to literally kill people. People would develop diabetes and 20 years in, they would lose their kidneys and they would die. And nowadays, it's not easy to have diabetes. Having diabetes is yucky. But with hard work, you can make diabetes boring. And I think that in 2020, we're already to the point where there are cases where we can make MS boring. And so that's what I hope to do with the people that I take care of in the now is to make their disease boring. I hope to be at the cutting edge so that as new remyelination therapies, as new uh, neuroprotective therapies, as new better improved ways of monitoring the disease come out, I can bring those immediately to my patients. And I think the next two decades of managing MS is going to get increasingly excited. That was an awesome question. Thank you for asking it. All right, let's take one more question. Then we'll jump back into some of the topics that I've prepared for us today. Uh, looking for another question. All right. So uh, Cameron, who is a great guy uh, and a computer guru, uh, writes in, question, um, thoughts on lion's mane as a supplement? Cameron, I have to be very frank with you. I don't know very much about lion's mane. I don't feel like I'm in a good position to share with you my thoughts because I don't really have a lot of knowledge base for lion's mane. Lion's mane is definitely a supplement or a naturally occurring substance that we were not taught about in medical school. And I'll tell you what, I am going to take it upon myself to read up on lion's mane so that the next time you and I talk, we can have a chit chat about it. The second part of the question says, how do I keep you as my clinician? Well, Cameron, what a wonderful thing for you to ask of me. Um, I would love to help continue to take care of folks here in central Ohio. So how do you do that? Um, it's not hard. Uh, the Boster Center for Multiple Sclerosis is opening. We're going to start to see patients in the middle of March. We're actually uh, scheduling appointments right now. And so all this past week, uh, myself and my team have been busy on the phone scheduling folks. Uh, we have a wonderful list of folks that have written in, and we're in the process of calling them back to get them scheduled. And if you would like an appointment, you have nothing more uh, than to request one. 
So how do you request an appointment? Um, there's a couple really easy ways. Probably one of the easiest ways is to call the clinic. And that number is 614-304-3444. And I'll write that uh, down for you. The Boster Center for Multiple Sclerosis, 614-304-3444. Uh, that's an easy way to do it. You can also go to our website. And that website, Cameron, is bosterms.com. And on the website, uh, you can click patient portal and you can literally pre-register. Um, if you can do either one of those two things, my team will call you back in the next couple of weeks and we will get you scheduled in the clinic. Uh, and we are actively scheduling folks in the clinic right now. I am so excited for the middle of March to hit when I can jump back in the clinic and see people in this brand new space that is absolutely beautiful. By the way, if you guys are curious about the clinic build out, Last week or maybe a week and a half ago, I put out a video on this channel where I did some um, videography of sort of the demolition and the first phase of the build out. Uh, my family was very, very involved in slinging sledgehammers and, and a bunch of other fun things. And I will, um, I will probably put out a second part two where I share the next phase of the building. Right now, we're getting very close. We're getting the floors put in. The walls are up. It's really starting to come in place, and it's really gorgeous, and I am super excited about it. Um, Cameron, thank you for asking that question. All right, so Matt is keeping things clean. Matt, thank you for that. Remember, this channel is about love. This channel is about community. This channel is about being stronger together. It's not about hate. It's not about haters. It's not about bad words. It's not about negativity. And so I really appreciate the moderators for keeping things clean and kind of family oriented. Okay, so um, two more questions and then we'll jump back into uh, some of the prepared things I have for you today. Um, Bluth Don asks, um, how do medicines differ from treating RRMS compared to PPMS or SPMS? Do they have different targets? Uh, what part of the disease or prevention? Um, and what can, a, can, what can a progressive patient take? And my answer to this is different than um, maybe the next guy's answer, but you're stuck on a live stream with me. And so I'm going to share with you my own opinion. I think that there's one disease called multiple sclerosis. I think there's one disease called MS and MS manifests many, many different ways. So if, if I use a silly analogy, if you think about a human, some humans are seven feet tall. Some humans are three feet tall. Now, most people are in between. Some humans are pasty and white, and some humans have really dark complexion. Some humans have blue eyes. Some humans have uh, green eyes. Some humans have no hair. Some humans have lots of hair. They're all humans. Those are different descriptions or outer appearances of humans. That's called a phenotype. And all of those different human phenotypes, they're all human beings. I think multiple sclerosis is one disease with many different phenotypes. I think some people develop a relapsing presentation of MS where they seem to have discrete attacks. I think some people have progressive disease states, but I think it's all the same thing. And there's a lot of evidence that supports what I'm telling you. I don't think that primary progressive MS is dramatically different than relapsing MS. I don't think so. I think they're remarkably similar. And if you look at our MS medications, there are medicines that treat both. They are, are able to slow progression of disease and they're able to decrease relapses. So I think that we've taken a wrong turn by trying to break up MS into little tiny sections and saying, this drug is just for this and this drug is just for this. And I don't really think that's true. I think that decreasing inflammation is important. I think that there is inflammation in primary progressive MS. I think that there's inflammation in relapsing remitting MS. It may present differently, but it's still there. And I think that quelling inflammation is a really, really good idea. So I love your question. Thank you for asking it. But the bottom line is, if you have MS, I want you on a therapy. And we're starting to realize increasingly that the medicines that we use for MS do way more than just decrease attacks, particularly the newer medicines. They do way more than just clean up new spots on the MRI, particularly the new medicines. Increasingly, I am more concerned about maintaining function, decreasing progression, trying to give back function with confirmed disability improvement. 
I am looking for no evidence of disease activity and no progression. Um, and so I think that we do a disservice if we try, we try to break things in the little tiny sections and say, well, this is over here and that's over there. That was a great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, down here, Lane asked a question. Biotin, 300 milligrams high dose to stop MS regression. So I think Lane means MS progression. And there are some clinical trials that demonstrate that high dose biotin, which is B7, can slow progression in PPMS and slow brain volume loss in PPMS. There is an, a giant clinical trial going on right now trying to definitively answer that question. And so I think that taking biotin is something to discuss with your clinician. I have prescribed biotin or recommended biotin to a lot of different patients. There are some caveats and some tricks and tips. If you take biotin at a very high level, it can actually change the results of some of your lab tests. And so, for example, you can get a lab test that says that your thyroid is wackadoodle when it's not. And so I don't want you just to go to the store and buy a bunch of biotin. I want you to make sure that you're talking to your MS provider um, to make sure that the, uh, the MS provider knows what you're doing. Uh, by the way, guys, my glasses are about shot. Um, and so there's a high likelihood that you're going to see this lens fall out during the course of uh, this chit chat today. So if that happens, that'll be uh, a funny moment. All right. Those were great questions. I want to turn my attention to one of the topics that I was excited about discussing today, and that's my evolving opinions about oral medicines. All right. So what are my ideas about oral medicines? It is very exciting that here in the United States, we have 21 different formulations of MS medicines. There's probably like 18 FDA approved medicines and some of the medicines have more than one dose. And so I count up 21 different medicines to slow MS and that's awesome. And recently we've had three oral medicines enter the market. We, uh, in the last uh, six some months, 12 months have had uh, Mazent, which is saponamod, which is a once daily oral pill. We've had Mavenclad, uh, which is the trade name for cladribine which is a very interesting oral medicine that you take a pill once a day for five days, wait a month, do it again, and then you wait a year, which is a very interesting way of taking a medicine. And most recently, there was the FDA approval of Vumeridy, which is diroxymal fumarate. And so I just wanted to give you guys sort of an update on where I stand with these medicines and my opinions. Now, my opinions don't make me right, they just make me opinionated. And just because I feel a certain way doesn't mean that you do. And what I'm sharing with you is really just sharing where I'm coming from. It's not intended to counteract or contradict your MS provider or your own opinions. If nothing else, I just want to share with you to give you food for thought. And maybe it will spur on a conversation amongst yourselves, with your community, with your family, maybe with your doctor. So here we go. I'll start off by talking about Mazent. So Mazent is saponamide. Uh, it is a S1P1 receptor modulator. It's in the class of family as Gelinia. And there's now increasingly new numbers of Gelinia-like medicines that are hitting the market. Um, interestingly, Mazent uh, saponamide is made by the same manufacturer of Gelinia. So Novartis uh, Pharmaceutical Company makes both those products. And I don't think Mazent is very interesting. Um, I think Mazent is a Gelinia Me Too drug. I think it brings darn near nothing new to the market. The way that Mazent was studied, there was an attempt at suggesting that it was going to be for progression, and they were not able to show something unique for the ability to slow secondary progressive MS. They did not achieve a unique label enabling um, uh, clinical trial result, which gave them a niche within secondary progressive MS. In fact, Mazent, like almost every MS medicine in the United States, is approved to be used in relapsing forms of MS. And when I look at the data, Mazent works best the younger the patient, not the older the patient. Mazent works best in people that had attacks in new spots, not in people that didn't. And in my opinion, the S1P1 class of medicines are best used early in the disease, not late in the disease. So I am not in love with Mazent. I don't think it brings a lot to the market um, as compared to Gelinia. Now, when you take Gelinia, you have to do a first dose monitoring, which is very annoying. You have to be monitored for the first day you take it for about six hours. 
With saponamide, generally you don't need to be monitored. There's a titration over four days. And that's a good thing and a bad thing. The bad thing is if you take a long weekend off Mazent, you're going to need to redo that. Um, so my evolving opinions on Mazent is that I don't see it being used in my practice. I don't see a big leg up over using the parent compound Gelinia. Um, I'm also bothered when a company tries to market something uh, really and push it in an area that I don't think it deserves to be pushed. That's my opinion. It does not make me right. If you're on Mazent and you're doing well, I am delighted. If you're a doc that likes Mazent, that's fantastic. Um, we're all entitled to our opinions and it's wonderful that we have so many different options to treat MS. I personally am not terribly excited about that specific opinion. Now, what about my thoughts on cladribine? Cladribine, which is uh, branded in the United States as Mavenclad, is an oral medicine. And it's one that I've become a little bit more interested. Whereas Mazent doesn't do much for me, Mavenclad may have a position um, in a clinical practice which might be right for patients. And so the thing that's most attractive to me about uh, Mavenclad or cladribine is the mechanism of action, the way that it approaches MS. It is induction therapy. I like to call it micro-induction because what you're doing with cladribine or with uh, Mavenclad is you're trying to suppress adult B and T cells and then let them come back in hopes that they behave nicer. And it's I like to refer to cladribine as a micro-induction. You take a pill daily for five days in a row, so Monday through Friday, and then you don't do anything for the rest of the month. And then the following month, you again take five days in a row, then you don't do anything for a year. And then on the anniversary, so at year one, you do that again, five days, wait a month, five days, and then you don't take it again. And that's really weird. That is a discontinuous medicine. I joke that it's like a reverse birth control pill because you're taking it for five days and not the rest of the month. And it's not trying to block cells from entering the brain. It's not trying to uh, shut them down so they can't access the brain. It's trying to retrain them by killing adult naughty cells and hoping that the new ones that come back behave better. Now, I think induction mechanistically is rather fascinating. Um, many of you know that I'm a big proponent of using induction therapy. I think that medicines like alemtuzumab, lemtrada are highly effective. And cladribine is an in induction style of therapy. So mechanistically, I'm attracted to that. Now, who would be the right patient for uh, cladribine? I think that if you are thinking about mechanism of action, you, there's really a decision tree. Do I want to consider induction therapy or do I not want to consider induction therapy? And someone who's going to consider induction therapy is going to accept upfront risk in exchange for the potential to have things be quiet in the absence of treatment. That's really the, the cost benefit of induction therapy. I accept upfront risk. So there's an increased risk of things early on after I take the therapy, but then I may have quiet disease for quite some time in the absence of retreatment. That's the philosophy that someone is going to embody if they're going to consider induction therapy. Now, there's an entire other way of doing it, which is actually the more common way, which is continually taking a medicine to suppress the disease. And so this would be an example of almost any of the other medicines. And I am not saying that induction is better than not induction or that induction is better than early, highly effective uh, therapy. I'm simply saying that they're different. And in my experience, the person that wants to embody induction therapy is not the person that wants to continually take a medicine and suppress the disease. They kind of are two different um, vantage points. So if you are interested in induction, then we're going to talk about the limited options of what's available in induction. Now, I think that the efficacy of Lemtrada is superior to that of cladribine. That's my opinion. And it doesn't make me right. It just makes me opinionated. And if we were picking an induction therapy exclusively based on efficacy, whether we might always pick alemtuzumab or lemtrada, but not every person who wants to consider induction is willing to accept the risk profile of lemtrada. So you can imagine a scenario in clinic where someone wants to go the induction route, 
but they're not comfortable with the risk profile of alentuzumab. And that's the person in whom we might consider a cladribine discussion. And I'm sharing this with you today because these are my evolving thoughts as I think about where these oral medicines may or may not fit in the clinical practice. And I think that there is mechanistically something attractive about cladribine. And I think that for some people, they may consider cladribine if they're considering induction. And very clearly, this is a detailed discussion that they're going to need to have with their provider. Um, and it's a conversation that I'm looking forward to having with my own patients in clinic. There's a third oral medicine that has come out on the market very recently, and that is Vumeridine. So Vumeridine is diroximal fumarate. And Vumeridine is very, very similar to uh, an existing medicine, Tecfidera, which is um, uh, a, a oral medicine that's taken twice a day. Vumeridine is two pills taken twice a day. And so what do I think about Vumeridine? I'm not terribly excited about it. I do not think that it brings much to the table as compared to Tecfidera. One of the potential benefits of Vumeridine over Tecfidera is the fact that there's less GI upset. So if someone really, really wanted to be on a pill, which is moderately effective, that you have to take on two occasions a day, but the GI issues with Tecfidera were not okay, there's a small chance that they might do better on Vumeridine. Do I think that that is exciting? No, I don't. Do I think that it's going to change the field of MS? No, I don't. Could it be a great drug for some people? Yes, it could be. Do I plan on using it in my clinical practice? Probably not very much. And so I just wanted to give you guys an update on kind of where I weigh in on my opinions about the oral medicines, Mazent, Mavenclad, and Vumeridy. Does it make me right? No, it just makes me opinionated. And would I like to hear your opinion? Yes, I would. So if you have had exposure to these oral medicines or if you're thinking about these oral medicines, leave a comment in the section below and I look forward to reading it. Um, let's turn our attention now to a sip of coffee. And then I'm going to answer some, some more questions in the live stream chat. That's really good coffee. All right, so let's look at some questions in the chat. All right, so this, um, I'm not going to pronounce this name correctly. Um, oh, no, Sternoga. So Sternoga, if I said your name wrong, I apologize. Uh, the question's a good question. Should we be worried about the coronavirus um, that we are at high, and, and are we at higher risk to get it? So right now, uh, there is a viral illness in China, the coronavirus which uh, is there's an outbreak uh, and there's been only a handful of cases. I'm aware of less than five cases in the United States. And these were all situations of people that had been in China and come back to the United States. And I think one spouse of someone got it. And so I think that there's a lot of concern for uh, the coronavirus. I practice uh, neurology here in the United States of America and I live in the United States of America. And I am not very concerned uh, personally about the coronavirus. I am much more concerned about influenza A. The flu, influenza, is much more deadly than the coronavirus. The flu is an epidemic in the United States. It is flu season. And so I am much more concerned about people being thoughtful about the flu than I am about the coronavirus. If I was living and practicing and giving this live stream in China, I might have a different answer. But I would like us, particularly here in the United States, to focus on prevention of the flu, influenza A, way more than I am concerned about possible concerns of coronavirus. So the flu is very serious. Now, people use the word the flu to mean any viral bug. So if you feel cruddy and you have a cough, and your buddy says, hey, want to go out and have a beer? Say, no, no, I'm home with the flu. But, but that doesn't reference influenza A. Influenza A is a wicked, wicked virus. Um, I'll re re share a very brief story. I got influenza A when I was a medical student. So at University of Cincinnati 100 years ago, I was a med student, and I came down with the flu, and I couldn't go to class. Now, I'm not, I wasn't one of those kids that went to class periodically. I went to every single class and I sat in the front row and I took notes because that's the way I had to to learn. I couldn't sit up in bed. Literally, 
I tried to sit up in bed and I thought I was going to die. That's the symptom of prostration. And I had to lay back down and it was mind numbing that I wasn't able to will myself to even stand in the setting of having flu virus. The flu is particularly concerning uh, to me this year. And if you have not yet gotten your flu shot, I want you to. And if you have MS and you might be thinking, is it safe to get the flu shot? Having MS alone is not a reason not to get the flu shot. Now, of course, we do not recommend live flu vaccines. We recommend dead vaccines. So the injection is the dead vaccine. Um, I would not recommend the nasal spray. Sometimes that's a live virus. I want the dead virus. And it's not 100% guaranteed that it'll protect against the flu, but it gives us our best fighting chance. Now, if you are on certain medicines with MS, if you're on immunosuppressants, you may need to talk to your MS provider about the timing of the flu shot. There are certain, uh, in, in certain medicines that there are windows of time when it's not a good idea to get the flu shot, but there's plenty of windows of time when it is a good idea. And most MS patients will benefit from having a flu shot once a year. So consider this a public service announcement. I am not terribly worried about the coronavirus. I am very worried about the flu. Influenza kills people annually um, in, in numbers that might uh, be staggering if you heard them. All right, there's 230 people on this chat. I have never, ever had this many people on a live stream. It warms my heart. Thank you very much. That is really fantastic. Um, let's turn to a couple other questions. Let's see here, what do we have? So I've got a question from Brenda Douglas. I'm on Abagio currently, and so uh, Abagio is one of the oral medicines for MS taken once a day. Uh, its uh, scientific name is teraflutamide. Uh, my platelets dropped to 112 three weeks ago on Abagio. My neurologist has me seeing a hematologist before we stop Abagio. My white blood cells were dropping too. So, um, Brenda, I can't answer uh, specifically for you. One, because I don't have enough information. Um, and two, um, I don't have enough information. But I do want to make a general comment. When you take a medicine, it's important to monitor that medicine. And when you take a medicine for MS, it's no different. Abagio, in my experience, is a very safe medicine. It's a medicine that I use a lot in the second half of the disease. I find it to be uh, very good as it relates to slowing disease progression and brain volume loss. But it can have an impact on the cells of the body. And so it's important to monitor that. And if you find abnormalities, we don't want to ignore them. And so I love the fact that your, uh, your neurologist wanted to bring in an expert helper. Hematologists are experts at blood. They're experts at platelets. They're experts at white blood cells. They're experts at red blood cells. And there are situations and times when I have concerns um, about someone's white blood cell count or their platelet count, and I may send them to see a hematologist to get an expert opinion. And so knowing that your neurologist has taken that step to me suggests that they're really paying close attention and I am glad that you're having that done. Um, the good news of, about many of the MS medicines, if there's an abnormality in laboratories, we can oftentimes stop the medicine and those labs will normalize. And so it's all about monitoring. If you are listening to this live stream and you take a medicine on a regular basis, I wanna make sure that you're monitoring the safety of that medicine. Most medicines, and I'm not talking about MS, I'm talking about medicines. Most medicines require some type of monitoring, monitoring the liver function to make sure that you're not hurting the liver, monitoring the kidney function for the same reason, monitoring the white blood cell count or the platelet count to make sure that they're not dropping. These are really important things to do to make sure that you're safe. Thank you for bringing that up. All right, there's a question about remyelination. I've touched on that already. So this is something um, a bit interesting. And so this is a comment or a question by Tara. And so Tara writes, I am currently on Ocrevus and I'm losing a ton of hair. Um, is this a current side effect? And so if you look at the package insert for Ocrevus or Ocrelizumab, um, I don't think it has a, a call out for hair loss. Um, so I hope I didn't just say something that's not true. But anecdotally, there are a minority of patients that feel like that they lose some hair when they take Ocrevus. Now, are they losing hair because of Ocrevus? I don't know, but I tend to believe them. And you are not a textbook, you're an individual human being. And it is possible that even if it's not a common side effect, or even 
Um, if nobody else is experiencing it, it doesn't mean that it's not happening to you. The bottom line is, you know your body and you know that you have less hair than you used to. And I think the onus is on us as a team to try to sort out what it could be. Uh, I have heard some patients very, very uncommonly share that their hair is a bit thinner on Ocrevus, but that is not something that I have heard or seen consistently. I would be very curious for the people that are on the live stream right now, if you're taking Ocrevus, have you noticed any change in your hair, whether it's gotten thicker or longer, or whether it's thinner and comes out more easily, what has been your experience? So type a comment in the chat and let us know if you've had any experience noticing that or not. I'd be very curious to hear your responses. Um, so this is a question from L. Hope um, or Laura K. Um, can you guide me uh, to a PubMed article you're referencing? Um, I'm looking myself. Thank you. Um, please check out. So I'm not sure what PubMed article we're referencing. Hmm. I'm going to have to read through the questions so that I can properly answer that. All right. Um, let me shift gears. Uh, we've been doing this for about 45 minutes. There's 234 of you online. And I would like to address the topic of medical marijuana, cannabis. So cannabis and MS. Let's talk a little bit about cannabis and MS. Cannabis and MS is quite a hot topic. And there's a tremendous amount out there, both in the scientific literature and in the public press. Um, it is on top of mind of MS um, providers and people impacted by MS. It's a very, very common discussion. And the theme of this live stream is my evolution of thought. And I have had some evolving thoughts about medical marijuana um, and as it relates to multiple sclerosis. So for those of you that have followed my YouTube channel, I have videos on this channel where I have re reviewed the scientific evidence or the lack of scientific evidence supporting the use of cannabis and MS. Now, to be clear, cannabis does not slow multiple sclerosis. So let's just say that. You can't slow MS by uh, THC or CBD or any of the other um, cannabinoids found in ganja, all right? When we talk about treating MS with cannabis, we're talking about treating symptoms. And when you look at the scientific literature, as I have uh, elucidated in other lectures, there's a general paucity of data proving uh, that you can do certain things with MS symptoms. That does not mean it doesn't work. That just means there's a paucity of symptoms or of, of evidence. When you look at the totality of the data, anecdotally, there's certainly a claim to be made and a little bit of scientific evidence to support the idea that cannabis can help certain symptoms in MS, particularly neuropathic pain and particularly spasticity in MS. Okay, so that's the scientific background uh, or the lack of scientific background. And the conclusion there is, I think that we have to do more research studying cannabinoids in MS. We have to study cannabinoids that are not smoked joints. We have to study cannabinoids that are vaped with a metered dose where we can control the dose or with oral medicines, uh, orally ingested medicines, so we can really study the pharmacology. So I'm going to throw that out there as my first comment. We need more research. And there's a lot of barriers to doing really solid, good cannabis research in the United States and abroad. But despite that, there are many, many states in the great uh, country of the United States, which have now created some forum by which you can have access to medical marijuana. And Ohio is one of them. And it is now uh, legal in Ohio uh, to have medical marijuana. That's a thing. And the field of medical marijuana is really picking up steam. Now, I have recently, and this is the first time that I'm announcing this publicly, so can I have a drum roll? I have recently become a, a licensed medical marijuana recommender. Uh, I spent the last several weeks going through a process where I had to do several uh, continuing medical education classes online. I had to take a bunch of tests online and pass them. Uh, I had to make an application to the Ohio State Medical Board. And this week came a certified recommender. So um, I have a certificate to recommend medical marijuana. And I thought I would spend a couple minutes and share with you why I decided to do that and how the process works here in Ohio, which I hope maybe you find interesting. So. 
In the state of Ohio, where I practice medicine, uh, there is a law that allows certain patients with certain diagnoses to qualify for medical marijuana. And one of the qualifying diagnoses is multiple sclerosis. Another qualifying diagnosis is spinal cord injury or damage. And so if you think about those two uh, qualifiers, that's 99% of the people that I treat in my practice because the majority of my practice is multiple sclerosis or related conditions, transverse myelitis, neuromyelitis optica, ADEM, other spinal cord issues. And I deal with a lot of spasticity from spinal cord issues. So most of the people that I would see in clinic um, meet qualifications based on those diagnoses. There's a third qualifying diagnosis that I see a lot of, and that's chronic refractory pain. And so unfortunately, neurological conditions can cause chronic refractory pain that's very severe. Things like transverse myelitis, optic neuritis, um, things like trigeminal neuralgia, et cetera. So the first comment that I want to make is there's um, a list of qualifying diagnoses. And you can do a Google search and you can look at those qualifying diagnoses. In the three that I just listed, multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injury or uh, damage, and chronic pain are things that I deal with all the time. And if you have one of those diagnoses, you can go to a doctor that has been approved as a certified recommender, and you have to have a, a relationship with that doctor. In other words, this is not like you go to the pharmacy and see a doc in the box once, and then you leave and never see them again. The intention is that you have a longstanding relationship with that doctor, kind of like the patients that I've been taking care of for 15 years in my practice for MS. And I think that makes a lot of sense because I, I'm not a fan of stop by, see a guy once, pick up a card, leave, and you never see him again. That's not the kind of therapeutic relationship that I want to cultivate with people. And I don't think that reflects what the medical marijuana law is shooting for. So you see a, a doctor that's been approved uh, as a recommender, and you have one of those qualifying diagnoses, and you have to prove that you have those diagnoses. And so the doctor would have to do fact checking to make sure that yes, in fact, that is a diagnosis. And there's a couple things that we want to be aware of. If you have a history of uh, substance abuse, if you have a history of psychosis, there's a, a conversation that we need to have about that. But that doesn't mean no, it just means that's a conversation. And the doctor can recommend you to be eligible for medical marijuana. Now, we're not prescribing medical marijuana. And that's very interesting because at the federal level, uh, can cannabis remains a scheduled one substance, which in my opinion is a little bit weird because scheduled one substances are things like heroin. And I don't put heroin and cocaine in cannabis in the same category, but uh, the federal government didn't ask me my opinion. And federally, uh, cannabis remains a Schedule One substance. Why is that relevant? Because it is illegal to prescribe a Schedule One substance. You can't go to a doctor and have them prescribe heroin. It's not an option. And so because cannabis, unfortunately, remains a Schedule One substance, you can't prescribe it, which is why we don't have doctors writing prescriptions. We have doctors that can recommend that you're eligible, all right? And so if uh, you have a qualifying diagnosis and you come to see a licensed recommender and you have a relationship with that licensed recommender, you go through a consent process where you talk about potential concerns, they can then recommend you. And then you can schedule with the state, you get a, um, you get a medical marijuana card, which gives you the right to go into a uh, into a dispensary, a medical marijuana dispensary. And in that medical marijuana dispensary, then you can purchase uh, cannabis items. And in Ohio, it's illegal to smoke. So you can't light the cannabis on fire and then breathe in the smoke to combust it. That's not uh, acceptable. It is acceptable to vape, which is where you heat the cannabis up below the level of combustion. So below the level of it being lit on fire, but a uh, uh, hot enough that vapors are let off. And so the terpenes and the uh, cannabinoids, the psychoactive substances, et cetera, are vaped into the air, and then you can breathe those in. And it's also legal to eat uh, or to ingest the cannabis. And so there are preparations where you can uh, orally ingest. And I think I'm okay with that because 
I do think that lighting something on fire and then sucking in the smoke is highly pro-inflammatory. It can create a tremendous amount of inflammation in the body, not just the lungs. And so I think doing things to minimize that, and I would submit to you that vaping is probably less pro-inflammatory than smoking. It's still inflammatory, but probably less so. And eating is certainly less pro-inflammatory uh, than smoking. And so these are the situations that we uh, find ourselves here in the great state of Ohio as it relates to medical marijuana. Now, why did I de decide to become a medical marijuana recommender? It's not because the science proves unequivocally something, all right? Because I've shared with you, the scientific literature is evolving and we need more studies. It's really for two reasons. Reason number one, anecdotally, I believe my patients. I have many, many patients who are, are sharing with me honestly behind closed doors that when they use cannabis, whether that be a CBD product or a THC product, they notice a significant benefit. And I can tell you story after story after story of someone who says, look, doc, if I use a little bit of cannabis before I go to bed, my spasticity goes away, my pain goes away, I can sleep through the night, I wake up and I'm not groggy. Your medicines that you gave me never did that for me. And in fact, since I've used a little bit of cannabis before bed, I'm able to stop one, two, three of your medicines. And so I don't think they're making that up. I don't think they're like, plotting to tell Dr. B something funny. I think they mean it. The second thing is, if somebody is in my care, all right, so they're my uh, MS patient and I am taking care of them and they would like to explore whether medical cannabis can help them, I don't want to make them go to another doctor. I don't want to make them leave my practice, go to another doctor, get the medical marijuana thing sorted out and come back. I think that's super inconvenient and it's not very considerate of me. And so I have opted to go through the process of becoming a medical marijuana recommender so that I can provide that to my patients and not make them go somewhere else. So um, that is an update on my thoughts on medical cannabis. Um, I was excited to share with you guys. This is actually the very first time I'm sharing this with anyone. So I would love to know your thoughts. Um, leave a comment in the section below about what you think about that. Does that make sense to you? Do you think that's crazy? Let me know where you weigh in and what your thoughts are. There are 213 patients or people. There are 233 folks that have gathered for this growing global online community. And that just makes me feel really, really good. There are 113 thumbs up. And if you're enjoying what we're doing right now, please give it a thumbs up. It means the world to me. It actually it helps out the channel as well. So let's take a look at some more questions. So here's a question. Um, my doc said, why do we need a script now? It's legal. So I started going to dispensaries. So in different states of the United States, there is recreational uh, marijuana that's been made legal in the state where you can go into a dispensary and purchase a marijuana product. There are other states where it's not legal recreationally, but it's legal in the medical context. And Ohio is one of those states. So in the state of Ohio, recreational marijuana is not legal, but it is legal, as I described to you, uh, in the setting of a qualifying medical diagnosis. And so each state's a little bit different. Uh, let's see. So Matt says, guys, I got to jump off. Um, so Matt Thank you very much for all of your help as a moderator. Super, super helpful. I really, really appreciate you. And I know that everyone else here does as well. Um, looking for some more questions. Let me flip through here and try to find another ask me anything MS question. Uh, there's a lot of blocked comments. Um, so here's a question. So this is a question from Gabby who says, can you talk about optic neuritis? Can treatment, et cetera, high dose intravenous steroids, et cetera. So optic neuritis is one of the three most common uh, initial presentations of MS. Um, I have a uh, lecture where I've done on optic neuritis on this YouTube channel. I'm going to try to multitask. And while I'm talking to you, I'm going to try to find that so that I can send you a link. Um, so wish me luck here as I multitask. Optic neuritis. There it is. Um, give me one second and I'm going to uh, provide this for you.
This is part of a lecture series I did looking at um, pain in multiple sclerosis. So here's a video uh, which is entitled Optinuritis Hurts. Uh, and you can check that out and, and kind of let me know what you think. Guys, this has been amazing. Um, I need to uh, thank every one of you uh, for energizing me, uh, for helping me get riled up, for supporting me in this YouTube channel, and honestly, for supporting me clinically. Um, I love you guys, and I'm so very, very grateful for the opportunity of connecting with you today. Uh, we've been doing this for an hour. There's been 246 people that have jumped online. That is a record for my channel, and it means the world to me. There's been 151 thumbs up. Uh, again, my name is Aaron Boster. I'm an MS neurologist in Columbus, Ohio, and I want to thank you for learning about MS with me. Uh, it is my ongoing and continued goal to energize, to educate, um, and, and to empower people impacted by MS, folks that have the disease, folks that are care partners of those that have the disease, people that come in contact with MS from all walks of life. And I want to thank each and every one of you for spending time with me today. Uh, I commit to you that I'm going to continue to put out a video of, of MS education every week. I'm doing that Monday mornings, and I will continue to put out videos Monday mornings. I will continue to jump online and provide uh, these forums where the global community can get together. It means the world to me. Thank you very, very much. I hope that you have a great February, and I'll look forward to talking to each and every one of you in the very near future. Take care.